very well today. So you you'll need might need to forgive me, but um I'm I'm perking up a little bit. So what D so what D D Takun is that right? So what D Takun? Hi everyone. Um today um this is going to be a very interactive session. So my first thing is that yes, I've spent a long time preparing and I at it and I've been talking, etc. But it's all a waste of time if you don't engage with me. So I see us today here as a community of learners. I'm sure I'm going to learn something from you and hopefully you can learn from me. So I ask that everybody engages and talks and feels comfortable and relaxed as we all work together today. I'm just going to get rid of this. I've got quite a few little online activities and you all know how technology works. So sometimes it takes a little while to shift screens, etc. So um, I hope you'll be patient. What I'd like to begin with is each of you just telling me your name and um, and what you're studying and what you hope to achieve from the session today so I've got a good idea that I'm going to target your needs so let's start up the top with is it Samutra is that how I say it yes actually my name is Sumitra uh, I'm okay. a lecturer for this program actually I'm Dr. Atit assistant <laughs> ha. Uh, I'm an observer and I would like to like ask you about this I'm graduated for PhD from this program as well I'm the first batch of this program uh yes and i would like to to know more and know a, a lot about about this because it's about this fear of study like it's not like have upgrading ha have something new about this so i would like to attend this class as well especially from you that i heard from dr atit that you are inspired him a lot about about theory about the uh, work integrated education. Well, I hope I can live up to your expectations. Thank <laughs> you, Sumitra. San Saruta, is it? Uh, I think Saruta is uh, the, 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 the staff that just coordinating about this soup, about this class, so. Yes, good, good morning. Morning. So you work at SUT, do you, Saruta? Yes. Okay. Manu, Manri, Manu, how do I say that? Many rat? Many rat? Many rat. Yeah. Doctor. So for me, I am a student in the PhD program. Uh -huh. And uh is I'm gonna tell you like it's not easy for me to read uh, about the international research, and today is the, the the good opportunity for me to listen for the original, <laughs> and is um uh, and I would like to know about more and more and more about the the this this part of the 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 program. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And we've got another Manirat. Man Is yeah. that right? It's right. She, she attend with two devices. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good way to confuse the presenter straight away, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, okay. I would like to. Like... <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and we've got Song Fam, is it? Song Fam? Are you there? Song Tam. Song Tam. No, all right. We'll go to Peng. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can. <clears throat> yes. Uh, my name is Pai Su Wu. I am from Myanmar, Parma. <laughs> I I, I land master degree in corporate education in here. Mm -hmm. I just finished one trimester. So this concept is really brand new for me because in Myanmar, we don't have the CV or core program. But in here, so when I land this program, so I feel really interested about it. 
So I hope that from today's lesson, uh, maybe I can learn more about the concept of cooperative education from you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, M. Siri Ref, is it? Today, I'm so happy. Um, uh, could you speak louder? Um, can you hear me now? Uh, Very faintly. Then I have, then I have been so throat for a few days. You know. Um, to, to me, it's really low. Yeah. Um, right here, and I've got my volume up as the high as I can get it. You know, I have two um, problems. Uh, the first problem is the problem about my health, and the second one is I have a problem with my um, a camera, my PC camera. Ah, oh, what a shame! But uh, I'm updating another. Um, I'm updating another PC, and then I will change to another PC after I have already updated. Um, one. This is uh, my old PC, you know, and that's why you cannot hear me clearly. It is very old, but I'm just using it um, for a, a short time after um, the new one already updated. I will change to. Um, okay. I'm so happy to uh, join this class, uh, and I cannot talk a lot because I have a sore throat. <laughs> you and me both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. So, um, oh, and song time can't uh, or open camera. So, if you can, I really like to see everybody because we all know the challenges of it's wonderful to be all face to face, and I wish I could be with you all there. Uh, we could brainstorm and work together, but we've got the online space and we can do it. However, what's really important is that we do engage with each other as much as we can face to face. I understand the challenges of technology. And if you can't turn your camera on, I understand that. But if you can, please leave it on so that I'm not going to lecture to you. We're going to work together today to talk about things. We're going to do some activities. I want you to ask questions throughout as well. And then I've got a reflective activity at the end which aligns to I know what you've you're doing post this session because Atita has shown me sent me the document so I'm hoping that post the session and the reflections that we do will be able to translate straight into your assessment and you will get everybody's ideas because we shouldn't be working alone the more ideas we've got the better so um it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's absolutely wonderful to join you all in this virtual meeting space. While there's lots of distance between us and a little bit of water, um, it's our collegial spirit and commitment to quality education that connects us, and we've all got that. What I've on the screen now, sorry, I've got to ask in my little arrow. So they're the objectives for the presentation today. I'll give you all a moment to look at those. I'm going to cover a lot, I'm warning you now, because today's a real overview. And then maybe later on, a tip might say, look, Sonia, we really want to just talk to you more about this or more about that. I'm very happy to join you for a conversation about particular aspects. But I thought today I would do a real overview. So I hope that's all right with everybody. A lot of it's my personal perspective. Based on my lived examples, I have taught a lot and I still do teach at University of Western Australia and Curtin University. So I'm always trying different things, but I am a passionate educator and I try to create learning experiences to really optimise student outcomes and build that community of learners. I like to try lots of different things. Some of them work and some of them don't, but I learn from my failures and I think about, reflect on it and think about how I should do it differently next time. What I want to do today is provoke some reflection in you and some insights about your approach to teaching and learning and how you might embrace the work integrated learning concept or co-op education concept. Perhaps we need to look at education um, in a refreshed way, giving the ch given the changing higher education interface as well and the different kinds of learners that we're now working with. So I'm going to use lots of examples from my personal and professional life 
and we'll touch on lots of areas, but they're all interrelated because you can't talk about assessment and you can't talk about curriculum and you can't talk about feedback as discrete paradigms. They're all very interconnected. Feel free to put your hand up if you've got a question at the time. Better to deal with it when it arises because an hour later it will have gone out of your mind. Feel free to put comments in the chat and we will be using the chat. Can everybody hear me okay? And is my space, sorry, my, the pace that I'm speaking, is that all right for everybody? Because I understand English is your second language. You sure? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. All good? All right. And let me know as soon as you think you, you, I'm going to, I tend, I'm a bit hyperactive, so I tend to go fast sometimes. So you've just got to tell, tell me. Uh, and this is the next slide. That's the objectives. And the next slide is all the things we're going to cover today. So I'm going to let, give you a minute to have a look at that. I won't read them through. I don't need to. I'm hoping to get through all of that. Some of it will go into more detail than others, but we ho hopefully will touch on all of that. So are you ready for the ride? Let's go. So the first thing I'd like you to think about is a really powerful or impactful learning experience that you've ever had in your life. You do not need to, it doesn't need to be just in, a, in an educational setting. It might be something you learned from somebody really inspirational or a mistake you made in your own personal life and you learned from that mistake. I just want you to think about it at the moment because obviously we want to make sure we have powerful learning experiences for our students. I want you to think about why you learnt, how did you learn, with whom did you learn, and then how have you applied that learning as you go through. I'll give you a quick example. I remember once I'd led teams for probably 25 years and I went through to a, um, did one of those uh, appraisals where everybody um, appraises you as a leader and you come up with a personality type, right? And everyone said, Sonia, you'll come out as an um, empathetic extrovert. And I did. I came out exactly as what they said, which was fine. So what the, what the presenter then did is had all the introverts on one side of the table and all the extroverts on the other side of the table. And he said to the introverts, how do these extroverts make you feel? Now, I knew many of the introverts, they were friends, but they said, oh, we're never good enough, we, we're too slow, they're too fast for us. So they talked about the impact that someone like me that's always in a hurry to do things has on them. And I realised that people work differently. People need di a different amounts of time. Just because I want something done yesterday, does other people need to think through things and it totally changed the way that I led teams in the future. And that was about 25 years ago now and it has absolutely impacted on how I lead teams. So that's the kind of powerful learning experiences I'm talking about. All right. So what we're going to do now, has everyone got something in mind? Now, I want you to think about that powerful learning experience. So we're going to go into the Mentimeter in a minute. We'll just do this. Uh, so what you're going to do is enter four words that describe that powerful learning moment. doesn't matter what words you use. So you can either use the, um, the QR code or I can copy and paste the link into the chat. What would you prefer I do? I can do both if you like. Can you copy the QR code? No, we can't, but but I can type it for you. Uh, no, I can It'd just like... copy, and copy link and then I'll just go to the chat. And paste. <clears throat> the link. Right, so you should be able to click on that link. And then I want you to enter four words that describe 
your most powerful learning moment? And then I have to stop sharing. Uh, let's give everybody a moment. You should be able to see. Can you see that word cloud coming up on the screen now? Yes, right. Thank you. Excuse me. Great. Let's give it a few more minutes. <clears throat> By the way, while everyone's doing that, what I'll do is I'll download all of the activities we do today, insert them into the um, PowerPoint and send it to a tit so everyone will have a copy of it because it'll give you some good ideas for your reflections and that as well. How are we going? Great. Excellent. So uh, if you haven't, just keep doing it if you uh, are still working on it because we want to get some really good words up there. Now, if you look at those words, they are how you perceive really powerful learning moments. So we've got to think as educators, what can we do for our students that encourages them to have those powerful learning moments? And it's not always standing up giving them a lecture. We want them to experience lots of things. We want them to immerse them in the learning. We want them to take some responsibility for their learning. We want them to have agency for their learning because learning is a partnership. It's not a didactic relationship. It's a partnership with me and you and we all learn from each other. And if you look at the words up there, we want lifelong learning. We don't want to learn for one moment in time or for an exam. We want to build on it and it inform our life skills going forward. Um, we want to be motivated. We want to be able to self-reflect. So all of those things are a certain type of learning experience, which brings us to... <clears throat> Sorry, it takes me a little bit of fun. I want to, oh, before we go on to work integrated learning, I did want to show you this was, so that that's your, oh, you can't see it, can you? Now, hang on, sorry, I've got to stop sharing and share again. Uh, share. And bring you all back. Now, what I wanted to do was when you, Think about powerful learning moments. I do this often with lots of groups. Uh, this is um, the list on the left, which I'll give you a moment to have a read through. That came from a group of staff in Croatia that I was working with. They saw that as perceptions of powerful learning moments. And if you have a look at those now, you'll see when we talk about cooperative education or work integrated learning, it encapsulates or encompasses all of those things. So they perceive that as powerful learning. And all the, the word cloud on the right came from a group of staff about powerful learning experiences um, in at uh, Curtin University, actually, in Perth. So you can see that that powerful learning is all about being dynamic and engaged and um, applying theory to practical situations, solving problems, working with others. So it's a very social learning scenario. This is from Singapore and Croatia, and they are 
the attributes that students should acquire during their studies. So let's think about this. Have a look at that word cloud. Has anybody got any ideas how we can promote curiosity in our students? Any ideas? How do you make students help students to be curious? Feel free to talk to me. I need you to turn your mic off. Peng, are you saying something? Uh, yes. For the student to be curious. Yep. Um, maybe um, teacher or instructor, so they should not provide the full explanation uh, for the lesson. So they were ask them some question or make the clues for the um, uh, topic or that uh, for something that they want the student to be delivered. So and then student uh, can make a uh, can uh, increase their curious and they can be having the opportunity to explore by themselves. Excellent. Great. So we don't stand and tell the students what we've they've got to know. We create learning scenarios so they can discover what so they are curious we're building their curiosity and we pose um, provocative sorts of problems and also they gain a lot of curiosity from working with other people because they get other people's thoughts and ideas and perceptions so we're always building their curiosity uh, and I've just got one more word cloud but so you can see how when we, there's this is from um, faculty at Curtin University again the other one was from um, staff I think that was Croatia. So you can see they're very similar. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. We are all saying the same thing. We've got to build these things in our students. We've got to empower them and get them to take ownership of their learning. I talk about that a lot, student agency. And during this presentation, I'm going to show you some examples of how we can build student agency. So let's now go on to work integrated learning. Today, I'm going to call it work integrated learning, if that's all right. Um, but all of those list of words there are words, types of work integrated learning. So I know you tend to use cooperative education, but I believe it, it, that there's a move to, to use work integrated learning more in Thailand. Is that correct? Right now, our official name is Cooperative and Work Integrated Education, okay. or CV in short. Okay, thank you. But what I will use today to mean exactly that is work integrated learning. Is everybody comfortable with that? I'm still talking about what happens in your context, but it's more of a global term and it is the term I use, so I hope that's okay. But all of those things are around work integrated learning and work integrated learning is not just a placement type of in industry. There's lots of different models of work integrated learning. Up there, and I know you have read the paper, so I'll just put it up there to refresh your memory. Um, about the definition. This definition has just been published. The way that we came up with the definition was we distilled, so we collected all the definitions of work integrated learning we could find, and we did some analysis of those definitions and came up with something that we think encompassed all of the different components of what work integrated learning should be. So that's the definition there. And then these are the defining features of work integrated learning. And I know you've read about those as well. And we're going to do a little activity in a minute about some of these um, defining features. In other words, it's not work integrated learning unless all of these defining features are evident. However, it's very important when you're talking about a work integrated learning curriculum that students are prepared. So tell me what you think would happen if I had a very shy, scared, nervous student who lacked a lot of confidence and all I said to them was, see you later, you're going off into industry to solve a really complex problem. Do you think that would work? No. So it, the poor student would suffer and fail, how can I help prepare that student? What would I have to build in that student in order for them to be comfortable and confident? What would I need to do? 
we have to prepare them before we send them to the industry, like the personal development skill within the classroom, like the uh, special treatment. Exactly. And uh, what I do is I do lots of activities in the classroom, lots of role playing. Um, we, we work through lots of building their confidence, them uh, working out where their strengths are and where their gaps are. Gaps are lots of self assessments, lots of self reflection, lots of sharing strategies with their peers, lots of peer feedback so that they're building their confidence and their skills in preparation for working with external stakeholders. So while all that preparation is not will specifically, it is a very important part to make the will experience valuable and worthwhile. Now, we're going to talk about failure in a little while and there's nothing wrong with failure because I've learned some of my most amazing life skills through failure, but we don't want our students to feel vulnerable and fail with their external stakeholders. We want them to feel confident and comfortable to ask questions. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun again. Uh, you just need to give me one minute to get out of this. And I need to go here. And I need to go here. Oh, hang on. Oh. And I need to go. Yeah. Right. And so we have to choose only one? Pardon? Uh, we have to choose one of three. So uh, no, I'm going three. in. There's a, a link now. Can you see the link in the chat? So this is a little quiz. So there's, I'm going to, st I've got to stop sharing. So we're, I've just got three of these. Um, So three, got a quiz. I've got three of these defining features and you're going to select what the definition of those defining features are. So if you click on that link and I'll stop sharing and share something else. Good. So what does active engagement in purposeful work tasks? I've got three people in. Oops, where are we? I'm going to put you all back here. Four, how many have we got on my mind two? So when you think about that um, defining feature of will, active engagement in purposeful work tasks. So while people are submitting their responses, what do you think it means? Let's go to Sumatra. Would you like to answer that question? What does active engagement mean to you? I think Sumita is on her phone. Ah, oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Manirat, is that how I say it? Manirat? Manirat? Yes. So what, what does active engagement mean to you? <clears throat> I should, I should I should pink one. Oh, have you picked pink one? Yeah, okay. So active engagement is around students, they're not passive learners, they don't sit back, they're engaged in the learning and they're engaged in experience. So it's very important that they're engaged, but those experiences are purposeful and they're related to their life skills. Now, work-related doesn't mean I can have a, a powerful learning experience and be active in the learning when it's around a community project, for example, or a community issue, and it builds my empathy and my ability to understand others' perceptions. So that's still really important. Uh, now, on, I've got to go. All right, the next one now you should see. Um, what does it mean to be relevant to the student's discipline? Mm -hmm. 
And you will see that on your screen, okay? So now choose the option that describes relevant to students' discipline. Mm -hmm. Good. Keep them coming. We've got two in there. Two. Right? Three? So what people are putting this in, let me tell you something a little bit about this. It's got to be relevant to their discipline, but a very powerful way to learn is through interdisciplinary collaboration as well. So if I'm a scientist and you work in education or um, we've got people who are, you know, mathematicians and physicists and marketers and digital media um, designers and things like that. What the most powerful learning is if they all work together because they come to a problem with different perspectives. So I'm still working at it from my own disciplinary perspective, but I'm getting a broader understanding of it because I'm getting other disciplinary perspectives. Does that make sense for everybody? So it should be related to my discipline but there's no problem working with other disciplines. And when it's got um, career interests, it means it's helping me. It's not always, because I might want a job at 20 and at 25, I might do something else. I've done lots of different things in my life. So it is always about clarifying where your career aspirations are at the time. And they can shift over time depending on experience, but students are always thinking of where they want to go in terms of their career, what interests them, what intrigues them, what motivates them, because that's a very important part of agency. Fabulous. Very good. All right, let's go back. So now I'm going to stop sharing again. And this is. So I'm just going to go back to the defining features. for a minute and I want you to ask me if there's any of the defining features that you don't understand that you would like me to explain in any more detail because I understand you've read the, the uh, paper or the chapter actually um, so I don't want to labour on about something you completely understand. Are there any there you would like to discuss further? So, no, everyone's comfortable with what they mean, those defining features. Yes, so those defining features are what work integrated learning or co-op education, the actual experience or experiences entail. But we remember there's a part that goes before it, preparation, and there's always a very important part after it. Okay. So this, the impact of work integrated learning is that it, you know, all the things we talked about, that powerful learning, what work integrated learning is that because it's based on partnerships and working collaboratively and in a work related or a community related context, it builds everybody's capacity. So when I'm working with industry, it's not just me who benefits industry learns from me we all bring something together and so do academic staff so when I've got students working uh, it, with industry partners I learn something from the industry partner and the industry partner learns something from me as an academic staff member so it the impact of will and why will is that it's very powerful number one it enhances student employability but it builds the capacity of all of us we all learn together rather than someone standing on a stage talking to you, we've got a collaborative learning environment. It strengthens our partnerships. 
I don't know about you, but I would much prefer to work with other people and learn from others and with others than by myself. It challenges us, us our way of thinking and doing, and it's important to be challenged because it makes us think about our values and our biases and makes us see the world from a different lens. It encourages innovation and creativity, but it does shift the academic teaching role to a different dimension because, as Pang said a little while ago, we're not so much a stand up and talk at people, we facilitate rich learning experiences and rich engagement. Um, it, it, the other thing about will it does challenge often our protocols, which are going to talk around assessment, our assessment policies, et cetera, often don't fit very well with work integrated learning. Um, it builds confidence, engages. So what it does do is also enables a personalised perspective. So the way that I structure my will learning experiences and my assessments and also my curriculum, it enables each of you to take from it. You still meet certain requirements, but you take from it what's relevant and personalised for you. It's not you're all learning exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. I'm able to cater to your personal needs but it does challenge traditional uh, ways of thinking and doing in education. Here's some models of will. So have a look at those, because will is not just placement. Um, we've just written a couple of chapters, and I think I might have sent them to you at, uh, on intensive will, which is like doing will, um, you know, one day a week for six weeks or, or just for one week, you're working with industry partners. I do a lot of industry-based problem solving with students. So they're not actually in industry, but the industry partner comes into the university and helps the students problem solve and work, um, work out solutions and gives the students feedback, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of the industry showcase, which was a really powerful assessment, learning experience and assessment that I had for an interdisciplinary group of students. Uh, I use case studies a lot. Now, case studies, which are real world case studies, are great um, also for preparing for will. But st a standalone case study without the input of an industry or an external partner is not will in itself. So what, what does it need to actually be considered will? What do we need to ask? Who do we need our students to work with as well? Have a drink. Who would like to have a go at that? Someone try you there. Yeah, you're off the phone, yeah? So who for it to be work integrated learning or co-op, who do our students need to engage with, as well as me as their teacher and all the resources? Who else do they need there for it to be considered work integrated learning? Of course, as you mentioned for the tea party for the previous yeah. slide, like yes. for students uh and the institution, the educational institution, and of course for the external stakeholder, I mean, for the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. So exactly. these, the, mm -hmm, this, these three parties should be like, have the like strength for coordinator to make yeah. the wheel strength. Excellent, thank you, perfect. So I can use case studies. You know, we talked about the preparation a little while ago. I can use case studies without my industry partner there. So that builds students' confidence. They get lots of peer feedback, they pose solutions, we, and they build their confidence, but it's only will or work integrated learning when they've got input and collaboration with an industry partner. Um, you'll get these slides, so you'll be able to see all of these. Now. I want you to think about this and I want you to talk to me. This is a networking event and one of, I taught, I'm going to refer to a few examples. I taught um, that they were, the course was called uh, Bachelor of Science, Advanced Science Honours and I taught second and third years for quite a few years. Now the idea for this course was that the students came from lots of different science disciplines. There were mathematicians, data analysts, data scientists, physicists, chemists, biologists, you name it all working together. Now, those students are particularly driven by passing exams. Do you know what I mean by that, don't you? They learnt, they were highly intelligent, they'd got needed a very high score to get into the, the course, and they were brilliant young people, but they'd been conditioned to pass exams. So I, my job was, I had them for a whole year, to ship them from that, and they did industry-based 
solved very complex industry-based problems. One of the things I got them to do was to go to networking events because none of them have thought, had thought about the sort of career they wanted to do. What they were really good at was passing exams. Yeah, but that's not going to get you a job, is it? Passing exams will not get you a job. So I want you to talk to me now. Do you think networking, think about the defining features of will. Do you think networking fits with those defining features? Yes, I think so. It does, because after the event too, of course, they had to come and reflect. So they were yeah. assessed and they had to build their networks because having networks is a very important part of your life. And you notice that when you get to my age and older, all your networks and being here today with all of you, which is awesome for me, is because I've got built very strong networks over my life. So it's a really important part. So, yes, it does fit with the world definition. Tell me what to be able to go and network. What kinds of capabilities or skills do you need? So team, teamwork. Sorry, what was that? Teamwork. Teamwork. Yes. Yeah. Great. What else do you need? Communication skills. Excellent. And complex community because I might talk to you and then I go and talk to a teacher and I might need to have a bit of a different way of talking to him. So I've got to be have those diverse communication skills and adapt according to who I'm speaking to. And I've got to be confident. Any other ideas? So do you think a networking, uh, attending networking events and then reflecting on it? is a good activity for students to do? Yes. Em, did you want to say something or have you finally got your camera going? Nice to see you. Oh, me? Yeah, just saying it's good to see you. We can all see you now. Do you, do you hear me now? Yeah, great. I, uh... I am trying to uh, make my camera work and I am uh, trying to look for my um, earphone because, you know, I have a problem with my uh, uh, sound, so I cannot speak loudly. If I cannot uh, find my earphone, I cannot speak loudly. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, about uh, to talk to you uh, something according to your uh, great explanation. Uh, but uh, because I have this problem, I, I couldn't I couldn't talk, and now I I I, I can right. solve uh, uh, the problem now uh, with my uh, talking. That's right. Um, you know, um, based on uh, what you are showing me, uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, it is uh, the best thing uh, that we we have like a networking event. It is also related to like a teamwork or some more thing. This is just my idea to share with yeah. thing. Yeah. Thank you. And you, by the way, you sound nice and clear now. So let's, mm -hmm. when you think about networking, we've decided that it is work integrated learning, but it's not placement work integrated learning. So it's one of those models of work integrated learning that's powerful. Let's have a think. So after I've sent all my students off on a big networking event where they went to a careers night, what kinds of activities or conversations would I have with them after the networking event, because it's very important that they debrief. What kinds of conversations? How would I have a conversation with them after? What would be important points to bring out of that networking event? Peng, did you say something? Conversation with students after a networking event or during a networking event. What do you mean? Yep. Things like. How did you communicate well? And some of those, oh, Sonia, I was so scared. I, But look, I did. I went up. To, I learned how to. I was much better at going up and starting a conversation with people. Great. How did you start a conversation? What did you do? I had a small talk. 
Yeah, I look. <laughs> did you look at people in the eye? Yes, Sonia, I did because we've done lots of practice in our workshops. So I looked at people. Did you smile? Yes, I did. But what did you still need to improve next time? Well, I still talked too quietly or I didn't speak clearly or I didn't promote myself enough. So those conversations around them realising what they did well and how they benefited from the event, but what they would do better next time so that they get more from that event. All right. So something like a networking, and it's not a lot of work, actually is can really promote powerful learning experiences. Now, let's think about quality curriculum for the future. Um, this is now that we've talked about all those things, if you're building together a quality curriculum, these are the components that are really important. Now, this is my PhD that I finished quite a few years ago now. This all came out of my PhD. I looked at, um, did case studies across three disciplines and I did, I always do too much. And one of them was the dimensions for quality curriculum. So um, I'll just quickly run through them if that's all right, because you've got to understand this to think about what, how it applies in the rest of the session today. Co-design with partners. So now that doesn't mean you're going to sit down with an industry partner and write a whole curriculum, but I might start with meeting an industry partner and say, what kinds of skills would you like to see in graduates that might come to you for jobs? And they can tell me, and then I can put it into education speak and embed it in the curriculum. So the partner's voice is in there. I do co-design assessments. So we sit down and design an assessment together. Um, and I'll talk about assessment a bit later on. Very authentic, which we've talked about. It should be also not just what students know, but how they do. So it's performance based so they can showcase their skills as well as know this, know what they know. Um, what came out very clearly was the curriculum needs to be, be very connected and cohesive. So not separate subjects, it all needs to blend in together and be scaffolded so students can progressively develop and it's building on their skills all the time. Socially constructed, which means as I've talked about, and I keep, there's a lot of value in working with and from learning from others. Unique or bespoke, that goes to the personalised learning that I talked about a moment ago. Interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, which I've also talked about, because that builds transformational learning. It shifts students' worldviews, and we'll look at that in a minute. Blended learning is very important these days, and by that I mean the digital and the face-to-face, -face, because digital now is a part of our world. Networked, we've talked about. We've always got to support that transition to employment. A lot of the feedback came back from the research that I do that we teach the students and we're doing better stuff, but there's still that transition to employment is very difficult for them. So they need help doing that. Given our global environment, that cultural capacity building is very important and the global perspectives. So they're elements of a quality curriculum to prepare our students for the future. Now we're going to look at a little bit. Uh, any questions at this point? Oh, um, so what's fundamental to Will, as we've said, is, is partnerships. And partnerships came out of all of my case studies and continue to come out of everything as very fundamental to quality work integrated learning. So successful will is premised on deep and mutually beneficial partnerships, not just will you take my student on a placement or will you donate money to us? It's those really deep partnerships. So you can do research with industry partners um, and students can uh, work closely with them. So up there you can see the reasons why, how we all benefit from partnerships. And this was a partnerships for employability framework that I developed. Have a read through those things and uh, let me know if there's something you want to discuss. Is there something that you don't quite understand what that means? This is a benefit of building partnerships.
some of it we've already talked about. Is there any item there you would like to discuss further? Uh, the last one, reciprocal role modeling and um, mentoring. Okay, great. So if we're all working together, um, have you all got a mentor or had a mentor in your lives? That's not necessarily someone in an education setting, but have you all had mentors in your life? Someone has helped guide you and support you? Someone you respect? Yes. Great. The first thing I always tell students is find a mentor. Find someone who you respect, who will be honest with you, who will give you feedback and guide you as you grow and develop. So that's about the mentoring aspect, Pang, but also um, that so if I work with an industry partner, we can be reciprocal role models for each other and both an academic staff member and an industry partner can be role model for the student. But many students can be role models for us. They, they can show us things and teach us things that we didn't know. So everybody in a partnership can role model for each other and we can also often develop mentoring relationships. Does that answer your question? Yes, so it, it means like academic, uh, industry and students, the, board, uh, the three parties can be room more at each other. Yep. And it's really powerful for me as an academic to have an industry partner as a mentor because I don't just see life from sitting inside academia. I see life more broadly and I'm better at teaching my students because I'm preparing my students often for a life outside academia. So if I have a mentor, he or she is able to broaden my skill set to include in how I cater to my students' needs. All right? Yes. Any any others? Thanks, Pang. It's good to have questions. Anything else on that list that you'd like further explanation for? Doctor, can you can you uh, uh, talk more about like uh, promote uh, lifelong learning? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm so interested in this point, you know, because um, <laughs> yeah. it is a kind of uh, like uh, education too. So I just want you to. Uh, share with us more about uh, like uh, uh, promotes uh, lifelong learning. Thank you. Uh, great. Good question. Um, so lifelong learning is obviously something where I'm always aspiring to keep learning. I never say great, I know it all, which is a part of the problem sometimes with our university degrees because our graduates think, great, I've in finished an undergraduate degree and here you all are doing postgraduate. I don't know about you, but I've studied and continued learning my whole life. But lifelong learning is not just about study. So it's about you're always aspiring to learn more and do more and be more. So lifelong learning, it never stops. That's the first part. Now, how does that, how is that strengthened in a partnership arrangement? Because an industry partner or a student might have an interest or a skill that I think, whoa, I'd really like to do that too. So I'm going to learn from them. And so it promotes different things I want to learn. So I keep learning and broadening my skills from those partnerships. Does that answer the question okay? Mm, I, I yes, uh, doctor. So uh, I mean that when even when uh, the people uh, work, uh, they they work every day, but um, they still have like uh, opportunity uh, to learn uh, from each other in their workplace. That's it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much. And we should always be open to learning from like. When this this doing this presentation for for you all to not presentation it's like a you know a, I like to think of it more as a workshop type of a scenario. Um, I I learn by doing it, and I hadn't really worked with a tit before, and I'm learning from a tit, and hopefully you know us sharing we're learning from each other and we're broadening our skills. Here I am talking to a group of people in Thailand. So you're not just learning from me. I hope you are, but I'm also gaining something from working with you. That's how I see the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Now, this is the, the characteristics of a partnership because we're not very good at doing partnerships. 
because we see it as just saying, oh, will you take my students on a placement? In fact, I'm working at the moment in Australia. There's a push for PhD candidates to undertake a work placement during their candidacy. And the government's incentives provided financial incentives for students and universities for students to do that. So the partnership isn't what the uni is doing is just going out to industry saying, will you take our PhD students? That's not a good way to do it. The partnership needs to be more around shared vision and goals. Because do you think industry benefits from PhD graduates? Sorry, PhD candidates? Do you think industry can benefit from that? Yes, no? Yes, yes, yes. Industry is yes. looking, yes, industry is looking for innovation, creativity, problem solving. What's your PhD all about? Researching. It's all about research. Exactly. So industry need us badly, but it's about how we work together to do that. So those, it's got to be, we've got to have a shared vision. We've got to have open, honest, and trustful communication. There's that word reciprocal again. So those reciprocal, tangible outcomes. So I benefit, industry benefits, and the student benefits. Another important part is very clear roles and responsibilities. So I know what's expected of me, the student knows what's expected of them, and their partner knows what's expected of them. Regularly review, reflect, um, evaluate and refine the process and it's very consultative and collaborative. So that's actually something that came out of my PhD, but it's something I um, live by as well. Now, we've talked about partnerships with industry. What about partnerships with students? Do you think partnerships with students are important? Partnership students with university or with institute? Yeah, our students in a university, if you've got students, do you think us building a partnership with our students is really important? Yes, yes, I think so. How might you do that? I think uh, partnership with the student is uh, very important um, because um, when like a uh, partnering, oh, sorry, uh, having partnership with the student is very important because uh, the student uh, can uh, can ask the question. The, care, the student can uh, ask for mentoring. The student can uh, ask for help or support when um, they need something. Yeah, and and uh, and also it is a kind of virus. Virus. <clears throat> so I tell you what my very first session when I start a new unit or a subject with students, regardless of whether they're PhD, master or undergraduate students, I always start with a nice walk in welcome and everything else and try and build a relationship. So we all feel comfortable. And then I say, right, I put a slide up and I say, these are my responsibilities. I think this is what I'm going to do for you and it's got things on it like be well prepared respond to your emails provide lots of feedback um uh, i'm going to run really interactive engaging workshops so i have all of those sorts of things done got the idea quality teaching type stuff yeah yeah and i say to them are you happy if i do all that and they all say well yes yeah, sonia that'd be great I'll get your assessments back on time with lots of feedback, all those sorts of things. And then I say, great. Now, what's your role? And we negotiate their roles and responsibilities as a learner. And we revisit them because I say to mm -hmm. them, I can do all this, but all of this is dependent on you being an engaged learner. And that starts the journey of building a partnership with the students and them taking ownership for their own learning. Now, I can't tell you everything I do today. In fact, we've only got half an hour left, but that gives you an idea of how I set the scene from day one. So these partnership things relate to our partnerships with students as well. They've got to trust me and I've got to trust them. Uh, where's my little, hang on, sorry, I've lost my little thing. Now, this is really quick, and you're going to have a good look at this when you get it. Um, so I 
one of the strategic projects, I actually won a $480,000 grant from an industry body in uh, the Minerals Council of Australia in 2021 or something. Um, and the reason was industry said, your mining engineering degree is no good. Mining engineering has totally changed. It's all digital now, and you're still teaching like you did 30 years ago. So, so they wanted to work with us to totally redesign the whole course, which we did. So I, I ran that project. And this is a part of, we co-designed assessment with our industry partners. And these two slides, I'm not going to go through them now because you can get this and have a look at it. It was very much a staged process. And this is another example because depending on the industry partner, you've got to negotiate the process for working with them because they're all quite different. So when you get this, you can have a good look at it and have a look at the process that we used for co-designing assessment with our industry and community partners. Now, what's our problem? Our problem is we're preparing students for jobs that don't exist, using technologies that haven't been invented yet to solve problems we don't even know what those problems are yet. That's why this notion of work integrated learning and building all those capabilities that we've already talked about are really important because we can't teach students all the knowledge and the facts they need for the future because we don't know them. In fact, knowledge is it's something like doubling every two years and there's more knowledge now in a year than was in the first 5,000 years of modern human race. So knowledge is growing quickly. So by the time we teach engineering, for example, what the engineer has learned in the first two years is irrelevant by the time they graduate. That's how fast things are changing in industry. So we've got to teach in a more dynamic way. Now, transformative learning, there's a definition of transformative learning. So transformative um, learning is afforded through interdisciplinary engagement so that students gain varied insights and see the world through a different lens, not just their own lens. Students solve dilemmas through the integration of different perspectives and assumptions and they question their biases and critical reflection is very important. So our students have to be good at reflection and we need to help them be good at reflection. So they've got to recognise what was learned, how it was learned. Do you remember our very first slide? What did you learn? How did you learn? And how did it shift the way you think? That's very important to recognising and undertaking transformational learning. And transformation permanently alters the way that you see the world. So it can be a social or an individual transformation, um, but it's inherently a, a transformation occurs through social interaction, but it also builds resilience. So why I've got there, because why I've got transformation here is because it's a very important aspect and outcome of quality curriculum, which we looked at a couple of minutes ago, and those work integrated learning components. Now, favourite topic. Assessment. So assessment is not something we do particularly well in higher education, and it still is one of our biggest problems because our policies tend to be outdated for what I see as assessment. Now, I don't know what your policy is like, and it's probably better that I don't, but what I, I see assessment as a continuum of the learning. So actually, I'm assessing my students all the time because it's not just, I'm always monitoring how they're going, giving them feedback on how they're going. Uh, they do lots of peer feedback and self-assessment. That's all assessment, okay? So, and then what they do is they have this continual assessment, but it's not taking my workload or it just happens as a part of the learning experience and there's certain points where they're assessed for marks or weighting so but it builds up to that it's that scaffolded developmental approach and then it's now we're doing a proper assessment and then that assessment builds on the rest of the learning so assessment is very scaffolded and connected so you've got to think of assessment for as and of learning 
That is, assessment should be a learning tool as well, as well as assessment of learning. So tell you what you know and how you're going at that time. It should allow risk and promote experimentation. So for example, my advanced science students that I mentioned a little while ago, they had to do really complex, solve really complex industry problems. They had to develop a way to do it. And then they didn't all work. Some of them did not find a solution. Was that important? What do you think was important for them out of that experience? So the solution is not important, but the experience is more important. <laughs> exactly. And the process. So they're in their final report, they tried this, didn't work. Tried this, didn't work. But it didn't work because of this and this and this. What I do next time is this. And I reflected on how I could have done it differently. So as long as they were aware of the process, as long as they were aware of what they could do differently, that's what's important. So I didn't assess them on their solution. I assess them on the process of the learning. And that's really important. So it's process versus product. And the student must be engaged in that so that once again, their, their student agency. Now, it doesn't mean I don't give grades, by the way. So traditional assessment down there is um, got, you know, that it's it's teacher driven rather than student driven. So what I do with my assessment is I just I develop, I provide very clear guidelines for my students. Uh, depending on, I, I have more flexibility for master level students or P PhD level students, of course, but um, there's still clear directions so they know exactly what's expected of them. And then I do a rubric, you know what I mean, but you do use term, yep. Yeah. So I just create, and then I take the rubric to them in the class and I say, here's the rubric. Do you get this? Do you know what I mean by this rubric? And they will have input into the rubric and say, well, Sonia, I think that, I, you know, that, that criteria needs to be different or, and I will co-design the rubric with the students. But I, I go in with a rubric to begin with. So they're having input into how they're assessed because it gives them some ownership over the assessment process. And they have to commit based on their own. Sorry, what was that paying? So, and, and also they have to be commitment based on their rule, right? They have yes. to be their own commitment based on their rule. Yeah. Um, now, what I want you to think about for one minute, think about assessments that you've had in your life. Think about how they made you feel. How do you feel when you're being assessed? Being assessed by Indisha? Yeah. Um, mostly the assessment are related with the um, academic things. Basically, in our education system, assessment is how much uh, mark you got in your exam. So I don't have a, a more experience about any other assessment apart from the academic assessment. Exactly. How did it make you feel? Give me one word for how what you think when you've got a big assessment coming up. Uh, maybe if the good reset, I would be happy. <laughs> yeah, but so I I taught and I still do teach um, assessment units for postgraduate education students. But I taught, um, at, I have also taught undergraduate students who was doing the assessment unit in their education degree. Okay, and I said to them, "How do you feel when you do an assessment?" And this is these are the words that came up. So every time they did an assessment, they felt stressed, stressed, nervous, pressured, uncomfortable, self-doubt. And then this is another group of students. Look at that. So my argument is, and I said to the students, I said, so you don't want your students to feel like that. Assessment, if you're well prepared and you're engaged and you're taking responsibility for your learning, assessment should not make you feel like that. It should be a part of your learning. So I want you to think about that. Uh, now, I, I want to make sure we've got time for a little bit of an activity at the end. So just have a look at uh, those principles of assessment design and ask me anything I think we've talked about a lot of them as well. Have a quick scan down there and ask me if there's anything you want me to explain.
A doctor, I would be uh, interested in like uh, a co-design, a student's external stakeholder are partners. So can you explain this more? Yeah, sure. So the couple of slides I skimmed through quite quickly, um, they show you how to co-design, so a couple of models for co-design with partners. Remember our external partners, they don't want to write assessments. They do not want to assess students. They don't mind giving students feedback about their performance in the workplace, but they don't want to give any final results. And we're educators, that's not their job. But co-designing, making sure that my assessments reflect the workplace skills that, that industry requires. So I always talk to industry about my assessments and make sure that it meets the standards of the workplace. And, you know, I just talked about sharing the rubric with students and the assessment instructions and getting feedback that they're co-designing and now if I really did it, I would help them co-design assessments with me right from the word go, but I can't because in policy, we've got to have all our assessments in 12 months before I teach the subject. You know what I mean? So that policy uh, environment is restrictive, but it's actually about working with those stakeholders to design uh, up the assessment to make sure it meets the needs and it's relevant for everybody. Is it about uh, is it about uh, uh, assessment tool? Simple, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, for yes. like uh, assessment tool, so it is not only uh, a great upon by school or uh, the teacher, but also uh, need to be a great upon by uh, like uh, ethnic stakeholder before using assessment tool to as assess the student. That. Yeah, yeah. It's just getting, because one of the big thing you saw when we talked about quality curriculum, it's relevant to the learner, it's personalised. So what's the point of me designing an assessment? And they go, well, Sonia, this doesn't even interest me. So we make sure it's designed so that, it, that it's either flexible enough so that they can pursue their own interests, still meet the requirements of the assessment. And I'm very fussy, by the way. You know, I always have very clear requirements, but they might do it on a topic that interests them, for example. So with feedback from them, I might reshape it a little so it's more flexible. Those sorts of things. So it's really a conversation with people, actually. Anything else Thank there? You so much. Thank you so much, Jan. Pleasure. For me, I... Uh, interest about peer assessment and self-assessment so i think this is so, important it is so um, um, that's in the next slides pang so shall i go on and um uh i've got the next slide after that talks about peer and self-assessment so we'll come back to it because i use both those um all the time and in fact i can even send it to a couple of their self-assessments that i use uh, and and you might want to have a look at them i use them with i've got one i use for phd students actually around their research skills so this is around a quality assessment profile and i'm going to quickly go through this because this is really important it absolutely must be aligned to learning outcomes so when you're designing an assessment you always make sure it's very aligned otherwise it's disconnected for students Students should always be encouraged to self-reflect and recognise their own areas of strength and areas for improvement so that your feedback only strengthens that. They're not relying only on your feedback. And we'll talk a bit about reflection in a moment. It always should promote future learning and development. So it's not an end point. It feeds into future learning. Expectations and standards are very clear. Um, and it's real world. There's lots of opportunities for feedback. So there's feedback all the way through the learning and then they get really strong feedback when they submit a formal assessment. Feedback is fundamental. Engaging, relevant, motivating, which is the co-design BM and building it so it's relevant. Now, just because students are doing doesn't mean that we're not tapping into their intellectual development because I can't do really complex tasks unless... I've got that intellectual capability to apply complex thinking to doing something. So it's very important that I build that connection into an assessment. 
That's quite a complex thing, but you know what I mean. It's not just about doing, I want to see the thinking as well. Scaffold and developmental that we've talked about. Different sorts of assessments shouldn't always be same, same real diversity in assessments. Student agency, peer and self-assessment, which we're going to look at, and a whole of course approach. So assessments are from a, 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 a sort of integrate across a whole of course rather than independently. Now, I'm actually going to skip through this part because we can perhaps look at, you'll get the slides. Uh, um, I've developed an authentic assessment framework that uh, I think will make sense to you. But if you have a look at it when you get the slides and you'd like a session to talk about it, I'm more than happy to do that, OK? But I want to make sure we've got enough time to talk about peer and self-assessment. I always try to do too much, by the way. This is typical of me. And, oh, hang on. Oops, hang on, sorry. I've gone to the wrong thing. Let me go here. Here we are. Uh, right. That is the authentic assessment framework, which I know you can't see but it's in the slide, so you'll get to have a good look at it. Now, peer assessment. I use it all the time, Payne, and that is the value of peer assessment. I constantly get students to give each other feedback. I get them working in groups or pairs. They come up with ideas, how they work together. For example, you know, the advanced science students again, I'm going to go back to them. So part of their assessment or part, one of the things they had to do, and I'll show you a photo of a showcase in a minute. One of the things that they had to do was um, they had to do a brand, a self brand, brand themselves and do a, you know, two minute pitch of their own skills. Got it? So we did through several iterations they developed, they wrote down what their aspirations were, what they were good at with, and then practiced it and they practiced it with their peers and their peers gave them feedback. No, you need to look at me, you need to speak more confidently. And, and then two weeks later, they change it based on feedback and practice again. Or I've done, um, uh, uh, I've got them all to work together. These were our master students. They had to do an interactive online presentation to all of their peers and they, all the peers gave each other feedback on the interactive presentation and how. So it's all the time, it's that peer feedback in all of their learning activities. And what that does is it actually makes your job as a teacher, if that's what you're doing, easy because you don't have to give the feedback. The peers give each other feedback, but it doesn't happen by accident. You've got to help them. I run a whole session on how to give, receive and respond to feedback. They need practice to get good at doing that. And giving, receiving and responding to feedback is an important work skill, isn't it? We get feedback. We've got to respond to it. So actually, it's a really important life skill. And that's peer, peer assessment um, helps do that. But I've, I use it all the time. Um, now, self-assessment, I, I use lots. So I start with, depending on, for example, the, the units that I run on assessment, I developed a self-assessment on assessment. And students do it at the beginning of the, the semester. And then we they have to identify on that what they're good at, what they're not good at, and how they're going to go about strengthening the areas they're not good at, right? And they share that with their peers and we revisit it throughout the semester and they reflect on it and see how they've improved. Now, often they can think they're really good at something and six weeks down the track they realise they weren't because they've had lots more experience. That's fine. They're constantly reassessing their own skills, okay? And you develop, um, I've, I've got a really good one I use with my research students and it starts off, it's, it's about their research skills and how they apply that in industry and they do that and they revisit it the whole time so they know what areas they've got to strengthen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this link, low tape. How are we going for time? Oh, my goodness me. Um, we're running out of time. So I'm going to paste that. and. One a minute. Yep. So what I need you to do is click on that. You're actually going to do a self-assessment now. I will. If you click on that, can do it. And I'll just stop sharing. 
and then I will share. This is a really simple one. Excellent. Look at that. So I've got one person. Oh, lost you all for a minute. Hang on. Now, this is a really simple task, but it's a self-assessment and you could use it with students all the time. I have got more, uh, you know, quite long self-assessments that students do, but it's still encouraging you to think about your own skills, isn't it? And what you could improve. Great. Got two people in. Three. Just get a couple more in there. Uh, four. Okay, one, two. Now, if I'm your teacher, if I looked at that self-assessment, which is all of your thoughts collated there, what area do you think I would try and focus most work on? What do you think people feel the least confident about? Assigning, implementing, authentic assessment. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so now you you just did the self-assessment, so it made you think about your skills, yes, but also it, as an as the teacher, I can look at that and think, okay, I can see where we need to focus our energies in learning. So self-assessments can be really powerful tools. Now, what I'm going to do, what's the time? 10.50. Um, uh, I just do want to show you a couple of things. Sorry, now I'm going to stop sharing again and we will, and then I'll share. Right, on the screen now you will see... <sighs> Um, a whole lot of examples of assessment tasks that you'll be able to have a good look at the different kinds of tasks when you get this. But I do want to show you the industry showcase I did. So this was my advanced science students. It was at the end of a year. We have got industry there. It was buzzing. And what the students had to do was develop a digital poster and they had to, we just invited people. They had random people coming to them so they couldn't prepare a speech. They had to respond to people's questions, promote their ideas, tell them about their project so that to design it and stand with their project and talk about it. Can you imagine the learning that's gone into that? It's very complex skills that they, and we had high level industry and academics that came along and it was electric and the students loved it and they worked together to put all of their digital posters up. And so it was a, it's a different kind of assessment. And I marked them. I was walking around trying to mark them, but they had little QR codes on all of their presentations. So everyone who talked to them was able to do, um, scan the QR code and submit are, um, some feedback for the student about how they performed and about their digital poster. So they got feedback from students, from other academics, from industry, and I was their lecturer. So that was really powerful. All right, I'm going to, we're going to run out of time, so you'll get all these. Um, and But I do want to spend five minutes doing some reflection in a minute. So the challenges are... Um, uh, we, we have a lot of challenges around work integrated learning, um, our governance processes, managing partnerships, and often we don't get workload or recognition for managing partnerships um, and maintaining those currency of resources. It's often not recognised for staff either and rewarded. We, our staff need lots of professional development. Um, and there's often, you know, there's competing agendas in a university about engaging with industry or writing a publication or whatever. Um, capturing student satisfaction with will is really difficult. 
How do you feel about it? But probably the biggest challenge I find, especially when you're working online, is getting student engagement and motivation because if you have not got that, work integrated learning curriculum is a waste of time. Students must be engaged and they must be motivated. And it's my job to do that in the early stages, but if I don't succeed, then that student does not learn as much from me as what um, they could. And there's some of the opportunities that it um, it also poses. So, you know, I've, I've got jobs with industry because of my partnership, so I can have dual roles and it is more motivating and engaging for students and all those other benefits we've talked about um, with working with partners. Uh, right. Uh, we've talked about... Our currency of curriculum is really tricky with some of our curriculum we're teaching. You know, I don't know what it's like in your university, but if I decide that I need to change some curriculum, it takes me 12 months for it to get approved. So we're not agile enough and often our curriculum is not current. Um, there's lots of drivers um, that I don't really work with the will context and what we measure as quality often is not because will is sometimes not got a definitive outcome. Our notion of a career that students don't no longer is a necessary career where you do the same job for 25 years. Students go into lots of different careers, do contract work. So we've got to be a little bit more flexible and our policies and procedures are really rigid, which doesn't help to have the engage with the nuances of will. All right, I want to. Learning from failure, a couple of good quotes. Failure is really powerful. Now, what I want you to do now is I do want to make sure we can talk while you're doing this. Because that's really important, this. Sorry. All right. This is a Google Jamboard, which I will... Uh, uh, well, I've got to get it up now. There's my Google Jamboard. There it is. All right. So while we're talking, and you can be asking me questions, what I want you to do, can you see that Google Jamboard? Yes? So you can go over here. You should be able to see that. My See over here, there's sticky notes. You can pull them. Oops. And you can write something that you've learned and save it on there like that. I actually want to go back to this one, sorry. So what I want you to do while we're talking is just think about what you learned from today, something you've learned. If your perspectives have changed, how have they changed? And then up here you can click on this arrow up here and think about about what the implications are for your future practice. Does that make sense for everybody? And then what you'll do is I'll download it and put it into the PowerPoint. So not only have you got your own ideas, you've got everybody else's ideas. So someone's in there already, great. I want to see some sticky notes and what, and if you don't put anything up there, that means I haven't done a very good job. So this is really great chance for me as a teacher also to reflect on how I'm doing and what I'm doing. So you need to, does everyone understand what you've got to do? Because this really helps with what a tip wants you to do afterwards, which is reflect, and you'll have lots of ideas. So your best to go over here. Here's the sticky notes here. Click on it and you'll get a sticky note up. That's it, someone's there. And then you can write in it. But you need to write in the note this. What did you learn from day today? How to say hi everyone in Thai. Safe. That's it. Can everyone put one up please? Great. Fabulous. We got one. Let's have another one.
So this is not only good for you to reflect on what you've learned, but it's also good for me. And what I want to see, how your perspectives have changed. And while you're doing that, has anybody got any questions or comments they would like to ask? Oh, what happened to our... Oh, there it is. Right, let's move this down here. So you've got to write on them. Are you right? Have you worked out how to do it? Okay, wait for me. I try to do it. So you just click on a sticky note. Oh, someone I learned more about. Will also been some I think what limitation. I I am trying to to uh, write something. Okay, good, good. Tisha, I, I think, think, I think. one limitation. I, I cannot write too much. <laughs> All right, just write one word. One word. One limitation, right? Okay, the work. Limitation. I, I, I cannot write too much. Yeah, you can put as many sticky notes of... as you like, Pang. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, do a lots of, lots of sticky notes. The more you've got up there, because this isn't just for me, this is about your ideas that you're all going to share. So I want to see something up there that you will all benefit from each other and each other's thoughts. Okay. And if we had a nice, you know, lots of things up there, then when you go to do your, uh, your assessment, then you're going to come here and there'll be lots of ideas you can, can draw on to do it. Okay. Um. While you're doing that, the rest of the presentation I've got here is there's um, a really good TED talk by Sir Ken Robertson in the PowerPoint, I suggest you all have a look at it. We won't go and look at it today. I was just going to tell you about it. He's amazing. I've got a list of resources on a slide for you and um, a bit about the Global Will modules, which is worth you considering. So the rest of it is um, really information. Great. Look at that. Fabulous. Now, has anyone got ideas about how these perspectives have changed? Now, do you know what we're doing now, don't you? We're reflecting. So, no, I had to skip through the reflection part. But you see how easy it is to get you to reflect? And students can't reflect by accident either, by the way. You've got to help them reflect and you build the complexity of their reflections. So what I've got you to do right now is reflect. And in a, in a fun way, I hope. And guess what? You're going to we're going to share all your reflections with each other. So keep doing that. So we've got a nice. You may not get time to um, go on to the next one. So that's yeah. So we'll we'll stick on this one. Perfect. What's usually important when you're reflecting is you have a look at the next pages. What are the implications for your future practice? So that's actually a really important part of reflection. Great. Fabulous. So any questions, comments? Because we're 12.01 now, so I'm guessing you've all got other things to do. They're all busy writing their sticky notes at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fabulous. I'm not, not telling you hear me now. Sorry. Okay, um, yeah, can I can you hear, hear me yes. now? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you, Em, yes. Uh, I, I, I have observed that your presentation slides uh, are very interesting. So uh, would you mind uh, sharing with us uh, your presentation slide? Absolutely. But what I'll do, Em, first is, you know, the activities we've done online, I can download them all and then I'll, I'll insert them in the slideshow. 
because it gives you a good idea. That's sort of the stuff I use to engage students as well. So I'll put all of those things with a little label on them, including this slide. I can download the Google Jamboard with all your ideas. So I'll insert them all in the slide today. And that's it. I'll send it to you, OK? Thank you, Achab. And, and I, so I you'll really have all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate your uh, lesson this morning, you know, uh, because even we are uh, from the distance to each other, that means uh, we, we are not close to each other, but you have prepared uh, different kinds of uh, activity uh, so that we can learn and share together. I, I'm really grateful with this thing. Thank you so much. Ajah. Well, thank you, Em. I'm really, because that would be that we feel as if we really shared our learning. That's very important to me. So I'm really pleased that you used that word then. I'm not very good at, you know, I don't just like to have this me talking and no interaction. So it's been really good to have your interaction today. And as I said, Atid, I'm more than happy if there's a certain part of it, because we, I knew we wouldn't get through everything. There's so much. If you just want to have a discussion in the future when you have a session and uh, there's a particular aspect you would all like to just talk about um, just for a conversation, I'm very happy to join you as well for further discussions if if appropriate, if useful. Look at that, great. Uh, so is there any uh, any other questions or comments before we formally finished today sorry my student phone please student do you have any other questions oh we have no questions for, for like me uh, thanks <laughs> for the teacher for, for me no more questions <laughs> lovely well it's been a real pleasure working with you this morning um, and yes. thank you for the opportunity to do that. I love working with people in different parts of the world. Um, and hopefully I get to meet you all in person one day. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yes, I also yes. hope so. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, okay, a as we wrap up today's session, um, I, I feel compelled to extend my thanks and appreciation for the exceptional lecture of Professor Ferns. Your, your presentation was not only informative, but also um, insightful, unveiling new aspect of work integrated learning to us. Um, and, and also your active learning approach uh, captivated us, fostering and, and engaging and, and dynamic environment that encouraged us to participate and contribute. Uh, I believe we are all grateful for the opportunity to to learn from you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. So I'll get all of the PowerPoint ready um, today at it and probably send it to you later on this evening, if that's all right, when all my meetings are over. Wonderful to meet you all. And please, um, my I'll put my email address on the PowerPoints. And you're more yes, than welcome yes. to email me if you want ideas or other resources or something. <laughs> Very welcome. Yes. All righty. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a great bye bye. day. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you next time. So we 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 have to leave now, right? Yeah, we have to leave now. We call okay. all all leave and except all two leave. of us. Okay. See you next time, Manira. See you, See you